Good morning, everyone. Dr. Randall Gates, board certified chiropractic neurologist, also a chiropractic physician at Gates Brain Health. Today, I'm doing my broadcast on mast cell activation syndrome and hormones. Uh, to go through it, I'm talking about mast cell activation syndrome a lot right now. Reason is multifactorial. <clears throat> One of them is that I've been working with autoimmune patients for a long time through dietary means, supplementation, uh, have seen some really tremendous improvements. However, it seemed as though maybe there was more that could be done. And I've also noticed, and probably many of you have read about this, that those who go on different types of diets for their autoimmune disease may develop intolerances to other foods through time, which is why diversity in the diet can be really important. And from that, I started looking into mast cell activation syndrome. What we now know is that about 20% of the population has mast cell activation, and it's a really, really big deal. And it may be, as I commonly say, the elephant in the room that's being missed uh, relative to your chronic disease. So that's why I'm talking about it. I've talked about mast cell activation syndrome and pain. I've talked about mast cells as it relates to chronic fatigue, uh, anxiety, bowel issues, and now today I'm talking about hormones. Um, in this discussion, and good morning to everyone who's joining, um, in, <clears throat> in reviewing this information, I've learned more, and I told you at the onset of this, I'm going to be learning with you as we go through this, because not many doctors know much about this. A lot of doctors are still even resistant to talking about this. Um, but it is, a, it is a really formidable issue, particularly now that I've been testing so many of my patients for this problem. So we'll pause right there. Um, go ahead and read the disclaimer. None of this is medical advice. Okay. And we'll hide that. And we'll bring this one in. So with autoimmune disease, we oftentimes see a female preponderance, and we even see that in most allergic disorders. So that raises the question of the literature, uh, is estrogen or progesterone potentially driving this condition more than is testosterone? Testosterone is typically higher in guys, estrogen and progesterone are typically higher in females. So uh, what researchers have found is that estrogen activates mast cells and the mast cells are what release histamine, but they also release a lot of other stuff. They release interleukins, they release other cytokines and they're a big driver of inflammation. So higher estrogen is going to activate mast cells to release histamine. And then histamine is responsible for the allergic type reaction. So if you, one common thing we see with mast cell activation is that it didn't just start one day. It probably started a long time ago. Seems that genetics drive it a lot uh, along with environment, but you may have a history of allergies, seasonal allergies when you were a kid. You may have had asthma. Maybe you developed allergies later on in life. And it, you just kind of see this domino effect of one thing happening and another thing happening. Maybe you have a mold sensitivity and then you you have chronic bone pain or you have chronic fatigue or you have horrible headaches, or now you have digestive problems. Going through the timeline of the history, oftentimes I can see that relationship. Uh, so it's kind of important for everyone to think about that. Uh, histamine activates the ovaries to make more estrogen, which can result in the vicious cycle of the estrogen, the histamine release. Uh, estrogen also downregulates the DAO enzyme responsible for breaking down histamines in our gut. That's an important thing for you to look up if you want. So DAO stands for diamine oxidase and DAO uh, is available via supplementation. So estrogen down regulates the production of this enzyme that breaks down histamine in our gut. So that's important. Progesterone stabilizes mast cells and inhibits the release of histamine. So I'll pause on that point. I do work with hormones with a lot of my patients, sometimes uh, many of you have asked me, you know, what can we do in terms of hormones and mast cell? And I've been holding off because I really wanted to delve into the literature. I have to say at this moment that many of you were right. And so I need to look at this mechanism deeper with my patients who have persistent mast cell issues driving other chronic problems. 
and progesterone upregulates the DAO enzyme. So that is also pretty significant. Uh, just so you know how hormones are produced. In essence, while a female is menstruating, we have two primary phases for the productions of hormones. We have the follicular phase. The follicular phase is where the follicles are growing. We're choosing one egg, so to speak, that is gonna get released. We have an LH surge, which then results in an estrogen spike right around the time that the egg is released from the ovaries. After that, estrogen should drop precipitously. In some of you, it doesn't, as you know, based on your blood tests. And progesterone should go up proportionally quite a bit. The purpose of progesterone is to maintain the lining of the uterus. So progesterone is there to create this beautiful environment for the egg to implant to if it's fertilized. Um, that's the purpose of progesterone. Yet, you know, lots of times that's not happening. So the progesterone is going to go up and then it's going to go down because if there's no fertilization of the egg, progesterone will go down. That results in sloughing off of the uterine lining, the endometrium, which results in menses. And then we start it all over. Hopefully every 28 days, this should be going on. Um, <clears throat> so that's important to understand. And maybe you see a relationship with your mast cell symptoms at different times of the month. Maybe not. And <clears throat> while this is the characteristic biology of the female reproductive tract, uh, hormonally, I will say again that I see a lot of women who always have low progesterone or they always have high progesterone or they always have high estrogen and low progesterone. So um, again, for those of you watching, uh, I will be paying more attention to this relative to mast cell symptoms. And then this is just a nice diagram. You can pause it. Uh, it's from a journal article out of uh, current opinions in allergy and clinical clinical immunology. Uh, it's just a diagram of how these hormones can interact with your B cells and your mast cells to produce allergy and asthma type symptoms. So you can pause that, access that journal article. That's one of the ones I used for today. So the take home point <clears throat> is that I'm going to be a lot more focused on hormones again with my mast cell patients. We know that stress hormones can irritate mast cells. We know that. We know other infectious things going on in the world the last two years trigger mast cells. Um, we know a lot about mast cell biology, way more now than we ever did. And it's gonna keep growing in my opinion. I did the broadcast last week on mast cell activation and irritable bowel syndrome. And that article came from the top scientific journal in the world. So. If you're talking to a doctor about mast cell and they, you know, balk at you, they don't take you seriously, they roll their eyes, just know that, you know, the information isn't out there yet. Lots of times it takes 20 years to make a change in clinical practice with a new phenomena. So keep that in mind. It's like 17 to 20 years. So we're just in the early stages of this. You know more about it than a lot of people. And uh, any questions you have, please send them to me. I'm always uh, excited to grow and learn uh, in this process with all of you. Okay, I think that's enough for Saturday morning. Have a great day, everyone, and I will be back next week.